Welcome everybody uh, to our In Conversation series, part of our Sotheby's Preferred and Museum Network program. Uh, today I'm delighted to be in conversation with uh, Dr. Tristan Hunt, uh, director at the Victoria and Albert since uh, uh, 2017. Um, I would like to stress, when I was asked uh, to ch choose a museum and uh, a director for my In Conversation series, I chose uh, the Victoria and Albert for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because uh, um, Sotheby's preferred and, uh, your, and the Victoria and Albert Museums, uh, they really work uh, in collaboration. There is a very nice partnership, but also because the Victoria and Albert Museum is very much a museum which is in my heart. Uh, it is there where I um, educated myself um, visiting the museum when I was 30 at Sotheby's Institute almost every day. And if I am at Sotheby's, I would say thank you to the Victoria and Albert Museum because you are part of my life. So, uh, Tristan, you are the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum since 2017, but you are also a writer, a broadcaster, um, uh, in, uh, an ex-politician, and uh, an historian. Uh, these times of COVID and virus, which is uh, your more challenging job of all the ones I've mentioned? Uh, well, Mario, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you and to Sotheby's. It's a, it's a great privilege to have our strong relationship with uh, Sotheby's. I'm glad we played a part in, in your education and decorative and fine arts. We have many of our curators who, who, who come through um, uh, Sotheby's training. It's a, it's a difficult time to be a director of a museum because what we love is the conversation between visitors and objects, the dialogue between the public and the collections. And when our doors are physically closed, that's obviously, it strikes at our, it strikes at our heart. Um, and thinking about the future, thinking about, you know, less money, uh, fewer audiences, less international partnerships, all of that is difficult. It is not easy being a politician and being a member of parliament in Britain, but I'd, I'd definitely say being a director of a national museum at a time of a pandemic is definitely putting me to the test. <laughs> so how do you manage to keep your audience engaged these days? And I can see that uh, as I am uh, in semi-lockdown in Paris. I was uh, in lockdown in London. I moved to Paris yesterday. I'm, I'm calling you from my apartment and I can see that you are still in lockdown in London in your apartment. So how are you going to keep engaged your audience? Because you have four million visitors every year. So it is a challenge. Yes, we had, we had four million visitors at, at South Kensington last year. Thanks partly to the, the phenomenon of our, our Christian Dior um, exhibition and we've always seen ourselves as the heart of London and Paris coming together so that was a that was a great exhibition to have I think we're providing more and more digital content uh, and I think this is the same with auction houses and with commercial galleries and with artists that whatever the next few months presents we know we're in a difficult situation for 12 18 24 months and so bringing new audiences to the collection through conversations like the one we're having, but also more specific digital content for members, for corporate partners, for supporters, as well as the public, is going to be a really important part of our plans into the future. That's not a problem, it seems to me, for the actual museum, because we've always found that the more you put online, the more people want to come through the door and see it for themselves. Very true. So are you going, when, when are you thinking, are you going to reopen the doors? We're still working out. I have a, visa, uh, I have a vested moment. interest in, in that question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As exactly. <you> can imagine. <laughs> um, so the, the UK government yesterday announced that they don't want museums to open before the early July. So we think we'll be opening sometime in, in, in later summer. Uh, early autumn. Um, the, the advice we're getting is that to begin with it'll be country houses and parks and sort of open heritage sites that'll be open uh, and then later into uh, August 
will there be a time for museums to think about opening? So that's our time frame at the moment. So it's still a few months. And uh, um, I imagine that you are uh, a huge machine uh, whenever you mount an exhibition. Um, I've, uh, I've seen that you are postponing your exhibitions uh, called Bags Inside Out, sponsored by Mulberry, um, and also uh, an exhibition on kimonos uh, from Kyoto to the catwalk. Uh, I love the title. So we have to wait for that, I suppose. So it was very sad. We, we, we opened Kimono just before um, the lockdown came in. And so our, our ambition is we've kept everything in, in beautiful uh, uh, storage and good environmental conditions, is that when we reopen, we will hopefully be able to reopen with that exhibition in place. But you're absolutely right. We've had to postpone our bags exhibition until later in the autumn. And I think this is a challenge that particularly UK museums face, which is that we've had very strong business models focused on exhibitions and a really big public program and that involves moving large numbers of people through often quite narrow areas at volume and we won't be able to do that in an era of physical distancing so we're wrestling now with how our our sums add up if we can't then also have big popular exhibitions like dior uh, like alexander mcqueen uh, like david bowie yeah. on that subject i would like to ask you and and sometimes I'm a bit worried, but I understand why you do this, and it's for a noble cause, of course. Um, uh, I see that more and more you put up really exhibitions on uh, fashion and fashion designers. I was really moved when I entered the box in the Alexandra McQueen exhibition at the VNA. So, um, are you doing this because uh, you are attract crowds, and of course, uh, uh, let's say you make money? or at the same time because uh, you hope to, uh, to direct those crowds eventually to other galleries at the end of the exhibitions, like the Indian gallery, like the Asian galleries, or the Renaissance galleries? I think, Mario, both of those reasons. We, we, we like to be a busy museum. We need to be a busy museum for our finances. But we also have this great cultural responsibility to support the UK fashion industry, to support creative uh, designers around, um, uh, around the UK and around the world. What, of course, we always want is for someone to be enticed into the v a by a, a popular exhibition. And then, yes, go and visit the Korean galleries and the ceramics galleries and the, uh, uh, and, and the South Asia galleries as, as part of their experience um, of the museum. Um, but we, we hope that we have a balanced program. And, and my belief always is that we only get the kind of big ticket exhibitions, the Pink Floyds and the Christian Dior's, because we also have exhibitions on medieval embroidery, on the architecture of Lockwood Kipling. Um, so you've got to have that balance or else we just become a, uh, a kind of theme park. Um, and we're, we're not that, we're, we're a museum. Very much so. And then I think that all these categories, they are very much interlinked. I think that we tend to forget that the Victorian Albert was set up really to inspire British designers and manufacturers. So um, I see these exhibitions linked uh, one with the other, but I have to say that when I read the, the bags inside out and the kimono, I said, great, I love fashion. But then when I read that you also have epic Iran, 5,000 years of history and watercolors from Dürer to Van Dyck, I said, wow, that's good. This is a very good balance. And <laughs> I felt really reassured. Um, I would like to ask you um, on this subject, really. Um, uh, I think we have a passion in common, Tristan. Uh, my first love when I was uh, um, a young, uh, yeah, a young adult um, uh, was uh, ceramics. And I think that you are a keen supporter of uh, ceramics. Um, the one million dollars question is, would you prefer to have a, 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 in your place at home a plate made in Urbino in the 16th century or a piece by Kate Malone inspired by nature at Watson Manor? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> the, great, the great 
good thing about the v and is you can have everything. But uh, yes, at, uh, at, well, what about you? At, at home, I would. I'm a great fan of Kate Malone. I think I think she's wonderful. But I'd go for the Urbino because I'm a historian, and uh, I think that, um, and particularly in Britain at the moment, we 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 need as much understanding as possible of our shared, common European cultural inheritance. Um, and I was I was a, you know I I I love ceramics, but I was a member of Parliament for for Stoke on Trent, the potteries. Uh, and so the great potting companies of Wedgwood and Spone and Minton and Dalton were all part of the communities I, I represented. Um, so having, having seen the, the kind of production side of it and now working in the museum where you have the, the greatest display of its wonders is an enormous privilege. By the way, I will surprise you, I will go for the Kate Malone today. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I love antiques, but here and then I like to mix with contemporary. <laughs> yes, very no, very clever. <laughs> um, uh, talking of uh, of museums in uh, in a way, um, uh, everybody knows that uh, um, a Victorian and Albert Museum for Childhood exists. Um, uh, did you think of these uh, as a way to inspire the future generation and to educate the future generations? Yes, we've got, we've got a big project at the Museum of Childhood, which is in East London, uh, part of the V&A, which has been there since the 1870s. And really, it's a it's a space which has grown a bit tired um, in recent years. And it's a museum of childhood that often parents and grandparents enjoy taking their children around for often nostalgic reasons to look at the toys yeah. of their childhood, but children themselves are, are not particularly excited by. So we're going to transform that museum into a place really to teach creative confidence and cultural capacity amongst young children, really a kind of young v &A, to think how do we encourage design thinking and creative thinking in early years? How do we encourage play? Um, how do we encourage playful behavior? How do we encourage imagination? So over the next few years, we're, we're gonna close the doors on it uh, and repurpose it as a museum really focused on creativity because we see in so many of our schools, particularly in the UK, I also know in France and elsewhere, that art, design, the humanities, the creative subjects are being stripped out of the curriculum. And it's really important for museums to encourage that back into young people's lives. And then you will teach us how to, how to raise the, the next generations of uh, young collectors, because we need that at Sotheby's. Absolutely. <laughs> so <that's> another <laughs> partnership between you and us. Exactly. And then uh, on the, I see that the Louvre has opened, of course, Abu Dhabi. There is now a branch of the Louvre in, uh, in Laon, in um, uh, not so, the same brand expands in other areas. And I've seen that uh, is uh, the VNDA in Dundee and uh, the VNDA East project for 2023. Those must be challenging projects as well, I suppose. Those are, I mean, we're very excited by the opening of VNA Dundee that's been opened for around uh, 15, 16 months now, a, a brilliant design museum in Scotland. Uh, architect Kengo Kuma did a beautiful job there, really, really exciting. And now we've got this big plan on the Olympic site in Stratford in East London to work with wow. the BBC, Sadler's Wells, the London College of Fashion, in a sense to do what the v &A was originally part of in South Kensington, that creative campus for new designers and talent. And Gus Casely Hayford, who was the director of the African Art Museum at the Smithsonian has come over to lead our work on that. East London has always been a place for creatives, for makers, for designers, for production, going back to the Beau Porcelain Works uh, in, the, in the 1770s. So we're, we're really excited to, to, to be there to create a different museum, but also to put our reserve collection facility. So a young Mario today will be able to wander through the stores of the VNA uh, to understand the collection uh, in much greater detail. I tell you, I remember when I visited your warehouses, 
which are full of stars. It's unbelievable. Um, one more question, Tristan. Um, imagine yourself being alone in the museum. All the visitors have gone, night, and which galleries really you think you will visit? Which are the galleries which really attract you the most? Well, at the moment, the, the museum is empty. And so I have wandered <laughs> occasionally just, just by myself. And I'm drawn to our, our cast courts, our plaster cast courts, which are all reproductions. They're all fakes. And yet in that one room, you have that Victorian sense of belief in modernity and how to think about the past and the present through the direction of great works of art. And so you have Michelangelo's David, you have Donatello's, you have Trajan's Column, Pisano's Pulpit, all in one wonderful room, giving you an account of a, a notion of European cultural civilization in one space, but also an excitement about how you can open it up to the public, that those who couldn't visit those places could go and see it for themselves for free at South Kensington. And for me, it's both a, a, an awesome, awe-inspiring space, but also speaks to the mission of the VNA. Yeah, I totally agree. It's a wonderful room. I love the scale of the exactly. plastic. It's very decadent. It reminds me of Grand Tourist, uh, who drew the the capitals and the ruins in Rome? Wow! Exactly. <laughs> Too beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria.